All right, we're going to get started. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Rob Fisher. I'm a member of the faculty here at the Mandel School and direct our master's in nonprofit organizations degree program. Thank you all for coming. So you all are the consummate volunteers. You voluntarily come here on, on a Friday afternoon, and we enticed you with food and a fantastic speaker. So uh, now the goal is retention. We've, we've reached you. Now we want to retain you through the entire session. Um, and then beyond uh, in your thinking about volunteer administration. Uh, this is part of a series offered by our uh, Office of Research and uh, Training here at the Mandel School and also sponsored by our M&O program. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Mark Hager from Arizona State University. Uh, I wanna say a few words about Mark and then I'll turn it over to him. Uh, Mark is a Associate Professor of Philanthropic Studies uh, in the School of Community Resources and Development at ASU. Uh, he is also the editor-in-chief of Nonprofit Management and Leadership, which is a journal uh, sponsored by uh, the Mandel School. Uh, there are copies at the back if you'd like to take a hard copy with you uh, to take a look at uh, things that are in the most recent issue. I did notice there's a piece from the fall that was called Episodic Volunteering at a Religious Mega Event, Pope Francis's Visit to Philadelphia, which sounds like an interesting tie-in to, to today's uh, topic. Uh, before uh, Mark went to Arizona State, he uh, was a researcher at the Center on Nonprofits and Philanthropy at the Urban Institute in DC. Uh, he's also been with, uh, was a researcher with Americans for the Arts and was on faculty at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he, he's known in the field as an editor, uh, a great editor, uh, and also as a scholar in his own right in, in a number of domains, uh, including volunteer uh, management and administration, which he'll be talking about today. Uh, he has a PhD in organizational psychology from the University of Minnesota. Uh, his dissertation uh, was on the topic of explaining demise in nonprofit organizations. Uh, he also has a master's in sociology from Minnesota and a BS in rhetoric and communications from Kansas State. So we'll see how his, how that, how your speaking style portrays that, that learning. Uh, he is uh, very well published and you can look him up on Google Scholar and other things and uh, learn more. Um, so as we turn to him, I wanted to put a couple things in your head as we talk about this topic. Um, independent sector reports that uh, 63, 63 million Americans uh, volunteered in 2017, 8 billion hours of service totaling uh, about 193 billion in, volunteer, in the value of volunteer time in that one year. So volunteers are part and parcel of our sector's work. We are dependent and uh, interdependent with our volunteers. They are essential to our mission and our margin. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, but beyond that, you know, thinking more, uh, more than just these are substitute FTEs, if you will, um, in our org chart, um, thinking about what brings them to the volunteer experience. And I'll just offer two quotes, one from um, someone from my hometown, Muhammad Ali, who said, service to others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. So that sense of duty that we, we bring to our ser volunteer service. And then from uh, UN, a former UN uh, Secretary General, uh, Kofi Annan, if our hopes of building a better and safer world are to become more than wishful thinking, we will need the engagement of volunteers more than ever. And so thinking about how volunteers are foundational to uh, that brought those, those finite missions that we have in our organizations, but also as a, as a, uh, as a third sector operating in tandem with our for-profit colleagues and our governmental colleagues in, in, in social mission. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark. Would you please join me in welcoming him? Thank you. Oh, just a note on uh, format. So Mark's gonna talk uh, for a while and then we'll have a, a nice Q&A and we'll ask if you do have questions along the way, 
I need to get this mic to you so that our, uh, our remote viewers can hear your question. Um, so I'll move around like Merv Griffin at that point. And theoretically, this uh, is projecting to you like the other mic was. Everybody can hear me OK? I've got a little clock over here on my phone I'm going to press start on. Um, my hope is to not talk at you more than 60 minutes or so, although I actually have no idea how long my talk takes. Um, but if there are points where people want to jump in as I'm going along, because there'll be a number of points where that can happen, um, yeah, let's do grab the mic or, or, or maybe even just shout loudly. I can, I can just repeat it. Let's not make it too complicated uh, and, and handle any of those uh, comments as we, as we go along. Uh, and, uh, and then hopefully a chunk of time there at the end for us to have some discussion, particularly about the points that you know, I'd like to get some uh, a particular feedback on, on, this, on this particular project. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you for hosting me uh, last night and, uh, and today. I'll be uh, traveling back home tomorrow. Only my third trip to Cleveland. Uh, thank you for my third trip to Cleveland. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the school uh, inviting me uh, to come and, and uh, talk with you today to meet with faculty, uh, to meet with, uh, with students. It's a nice professional uh, opportunity for me and I, I really do appreciate that. Uh, beyond that though, I, uh, I, uh, I want to express the appreciation that this uh, for the support uh, uh, that the school has given to me in, uh, in uh, allowing me to be the editor of Nonprofit Management and Leadership for a little over three years now. Um, and I'll continue on that for uh, at least a little while. It's a journal uh, that Dennis Young, who's in the room, uh, founded some years ago. So it's always intimidating to talk about NML with, uh, with Dennis in the room, but uh, uh, glad that, uh, that Dennis is here. So unless the, uh, the school uh, in their national service several years ago and said, Mark Hager, please come uh, be the editor of NML. I wouldn't have had that opportunity. And because of it, uh, I've had a lot of uh, professional development, certainly uh, uh, personal development in having that opportunity. Uh, but it's also given me exposure to the literature of the field that I would not have had exposure to and uh, introductions to a great variety of scholars across the field that I wouldn't have had introduction to. So it's been a it's, uh, it's been continues to be a great experience, and I and I really do uh, I really appreciate that. Fielding a national study of volunteer administration, as advertised on the posters around and on on Twitter, uh, title of, of the talk that I decided to focus on today, a, a topic of uh, long focus uh, for me. Uh, what I want to do is spend this now part of an hour uh, giving an overview of uh, sort of a long history of a project. Uh, I want to give you some uh, some rationale for where it came from. I want to, as, as, uh, as, as scholars in the room, give you some details of what we did methodologically and show you the promise of the kinds of things we're able to learn from that particular research uh, enterprise. Uh, but all of that and talking about sort of now a rather old and aging study is a step toward uh, telling you about uh, the next steps. We are in the very early stages of revisiting this particular topic uh, with, uh, with new, uh, new funded uh, project data. And uh, we're, we're sort of at that moment where we think we know how, how we're pushing forward, but every opportunity to uh, hear from people in terms of both method and substance can have a real impact on the future of this particular project. So um, that's where I'm ultimately headed at the end of this talk today, to sensitizing you to where this project has been, which will be the meat of what I talk about, but uh, feedback toward uh, where we're going uh, will, will certainly be valuable. I start with this picture up here. and. Uh, I don't know how well you can, you can see this. Uh, one of the four students in this picture is my older daughter. Uh, she's now 14, uh, Zoe. This picture was taken a few years ago when uh, she and her classmates uh, had gone on a trip to a local nonprofit organization in Phoenix called St. Vincent de Paul, which, um, among other things, provides a place for uh, people to come and have a meal. 
And uh, so he goes to a private Catholic school. One of the mottos of that school is kids for others. And so they're always trying to encourage st these students to think about how they can contribute to their broader community. And their trip to Vincent, St. Vincent de Paul to make uh, pumpkin pies on this day was, was part of that. I don't know that it takes a team of four kids to make that pumpkin pie. And in this case, you have at least one child that's holding the bowl of eggs. And that's my daughter, Zoe, there, who is, uh, is starting to put the pumpkin into it. At least the other two kids look engaged what's going on. They're smiling, at least at the moment that this picture is taken. And I get the sense that these four students uh, feel like they were useful on this day. They, uh, they learned a little bit about St. Vincent de Paul. Uh, they created a pie together that they were told, uh, you know, was, was, uh, was, was part of what was served at the meal that night. And so when Zoe came home that night and told me about her day, um, you know, she felt like she was engaged in this community organization, learned about it, and was enthusiastic about continuing to be a, a kid for others. Well, I want to capitalize on that. So she and I, uh, you know, some, some, some weeks later, uh, make an appointment uh, one weekend to go uh, work at a local food bank. So she and her dad go to the local food bank for a two-hour block of time that we are assigned to. And that went somewhat less well. We, uh, the first 15 minutes that we were there, we were herded into a waiting room with a variety of other uh, prospective volunteers, strangers to us. And, uh, you know, we were, uh, you know, we thought we were on the clock to be doing our volunteer assignment, but it was 15 to 20 minutes before uh, anything actually happened. When things started to happen, it became clear that at that two hour block of time, they were way, way overbooked with the number of volunteers that they needed on that particular time slot. So we did two things in the remaining time that was left. One was clearly busy work. Honestly, I don't remember what it was, but it was some pointless exercise to at least put these extra volunteers to work for a little while. The second thing we did was at least related to the assembly line of uh, food boxes that people were putting together. And the thing is, it was way, way overstaffed in terms of the volunteers working on it. And Zoe's dad is a little bit task oriented and he had to be the guy in there doing the work, which meant that Zoe sometimes inevitably was left to the side wondering how useful she was. On the trip home, I asked her about uh, you know how her time at uh, the local food bank was, and she said she didn't feel useful. She didn't feel like she had contributed much to the good of the community. And in the several times after that, when I asked her if she wanted to sign up for another slot at the at the local food bank, she said, "No. Why would I want to go back uh, and volunteer at that particular uh, food bank?" Everyone volunteers or not, and thinking about how they're going to engage with their community, do a constant assessment of their connectedness to prospective community organizations. There's a perspective that sort of captures this, and it's a psychological contract perspective, which helps us to sort of articulate the sort of the individual attitude towards potential engagements with community. Depends a lot on individual values, individual reasons why people volunteer, but it's a constant iterative decision about whether or not that perspective opportunity matches with what I, I want to do. It first begins with just an awareness of various opportunities. Am I interested in helping puppies? Am I interested in white supremacy? I have opportunities to do either one of those kinds of things in terms of engagement with my community. What do my values tell me? What do my interests tell me? And I'm led one way or another depending on, 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 on my psychological states. To the extent that I'm positively drawn to one of those, uh, I start to become more aware of opportunities, the cause as a whole, but also organizations that are ways to connect to a particular cause. There are, uh, there's marketing that is done. To the extent that marketing is appealing to me, and to the extent that marketing implies that I can have a productive relationship with that organization, it reinforces the psychological contract that I'm starting to form with that particular cause or that particular organization organization. If it doesn't appeal to me, if something doesn't seem quite right, the contract breaks and I step away and I find something else to do with my time. Netflix is always waiting for me. Uh, but to the extent that it reinforces the psychological contract, I take another step. I uh, 
I, uh, I, I maybe learn a little bit more about the organization. The internet is helpful. Maybe I see marketing of the organization. I respond to a recruitment request, or if I'm more productive, I actually approach the organization myself. I'm able to learn more about it. I actually interact with people in the organization, staff members, other volunteers, and I get a better sense of, does this line up with who I am, what I want to do? To the extent that it does, it reinforces the psychological contract. I might take a step closer to reinforcing a relationship with that organization, but if it doesn't resonate with me, it's easy to step away and do something else. I step in further. I'm recruited now. I'm willing to spend time with this organization. There is an onboarding opportunity where I'm oriented to the organization, and I, I see what they want me to do. I see how they treat volunteers. I see the policies they have. I, I see their, their orientation to, to volunteers. And to the extent that that resonates with me, again, it's reinforced. If it's not, you step away. Ultimately, if all goes well, volunteers spend productive, hopefully long-term opportunities within, within organizations. To the extent that in this constantly iterative process, the psychological contract is reinforced and we, uh, we, uh, we have a productive relationship with our volunteers. It's the volunteer who always makes this decision. They, uh, to the extent it's reinforced, they're there for the long haul. Any little step along the way, uh, any little misstep along the way can break that psychological contract and volunteers leave all the time. On the organizational side, there's a commitment to providing uh, productive experiences for volunteers. And there's a term that my long-term colleague, Jeff Brudney, coined in the course of this project called volunteer management capacity that we often abbreviate to VMC because we refer to it so much. This is the organizational side. What is the organization doing in terms of support of staff that are dedicated to providing uh, 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 good experiences to volunteers or various management practices in place that are geared to giving good experiences to volunteers? These two things together, the psychological contract on the individual volunteer side and volunteer management capacity on the organizational side are at least two we like to think pretty big things that contribute to a couple of important outcomes for vol an organization's engagement with volunteers. Their ability to recruit volunteers and bring them in to, uh, to help to work with organizational needs and retaining those volunteers over time because the volunteers found that to be a productive use of the time. So this is sort of a conceptual backdrop for a long-term project that, uh, that I have been working with. It goes back, I don't know, do the math, 16 years ago? Some of you in the room weren't even born 16 years ago. Uh, this is the younger George Bush who gave a, um, a momentous State of the Union address in 2002. It's momentous because this is just four months after a terrorist attack in New York, Washington, D.C., and Pennsylvania. And so this, the country is just coming to grips with, with what had happened and how we're going to respond to it. And there was a lot of patriotic community oneness that was happening in these months after these, these, these terrorist attacks. And uh, our president tapped into that to some extent in the speech that he gave and actually called out the value of community and the value of contributing to community. Some of his words here in the 2002 State of the Union Address, my call tonight is for every American to commit at least two years, 4,000 hours over the rest of your lifetime to the service of your neighbors and your nation. It's not too often that our nonprofit sector, our community organizations, get such a specific call out by a president, let alone in such a momentous address. Uh, this produced two pretty different kinds of reactions in our field of nonprofit and philanthropic studies. Uh, one is, yay, more volunteers. The prospect of bringing people in to serve more people in community, especially at the time of this, is a really uh, positive thing. The second response was, oh no, more volunteers. 
The concern was uh, that uh, many, many organizations in the nonprofit sector, and we were also tasked to think about congregations at this time as well, uh, don't do a very good job at providing uh, experiences, productive experiences for their volunteers. What would it mean to send an army of volunteers out to these community organizations only to give them, uh, uh, only to provide them with uh, inadequate uh, uh, um, uh, opportunities to serve their communities? And so the field pushes back a little bit and says, we don't know if we're ready. At least what can you do, federal government, to provide us with something that will help be helpful in, in supporting uh, this, this, this group of volunteers? Uh, seems like 100 years ago, this Republican administration listened and moved very productively toward uh, trying to answer this question. They had at the time a uh, office of the White House that was geared towards sort of these kinds of community engagement exercises and communication around that. It was called the USA Freedom Corps. There was another federal agency, still exists, it was much younger at the time, the Corporation for National Community Service, that had a little more history and substance to it. Uh, it actually had a research arm, uh, and it had mechanisms for actually contracting with private organizations to get a handle on, on, on various research questions. And so they were asking the question, how prepared are nonprofit organizations and congregations to work with volunteers? What can we do to help them be more, more productive? The Corporation for National Community Service and their research arm had some resources to put towards such a question, but not as much as they want, wanted. Uh, so they went to the UPS Foundation. The UPS Foundation at the time had recently put out a, uh, a, a research report. It was a very basic thing, like you see a lot of like foundations or community organizations. So they've done a basic survey, put out some descriptive information that routinely gets ignored. There was a particular question in this obscure report that suddenly got everybody's attention. It was uh, just a simple research finding that uh, some 60% of volunteers say they had left their volunteer assignments because they felt like their time wasn't well used. That the uh, organizations uh, were not prepared to really give, make, make, make good use of their, of their skills. And so the UPS Foundation climbed aboard with a commitment of resources to get a handle nationally on this question of readiness of nonprofit organizations to, to work with volunteers. They needed a research partner. I don't know how, how widely they shopped their RFP at the time, but uh, I know they came pretty quickly to my, my uh, boss at the Urban Institute, Elizabeth Boris, and said, are you guys prepared to tackle this rather big and meaty question on a pretty short timeline? And I don't know how many people in our center she talked to, but I, she came to me at some point where I'm like, yeah, I can actually see that in my head. I can imagine pretty quickly what a survey design might look like where we can start to get at this question. And so we answered that RFP and ended up being the research partner on this, uh, what is still the only national study of volunteer administration in the United States. As an academic audience, I want to give you some details of, of that particular project, especially given that I want to talk later uh, here in my hour about what's coming next in this particular project. We needed a sampling frame that represented the population of organizations that we were interested in. This was 2000, late 2002, early 2003. We had at that time uh, a good sense of, uh, at least in the year 2000, what a population of, 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 uh, of American charities, nonprofit organizations, uh, looked like. So we sampled those from uh, filers uh, at, the, at the IRS. Um, about 215,000 organizations that ended up falling into our, into our sampling frame. If you just sample randomly from the, that list of charities, you get almost all small organizations. Any distribution of nonprofit organizations is always gonna show many, many, many small ones uh, and many and very, very few large ones. So at risk of not having uh, any large organizations in our sample, we, we stratified into five different size categories to make sure that we had a, enough large and medium-sized cases in order to talk about 
uh, uh, volunteer administration. We also stratified into seven different subsector, which was probably not necessary. Necessary. We probably could have sampled randomly uh, across and gotten a good representation of, of subsectors, but uh, we stratified within size and, and subsector. I drew a nice round 3,000 for the study. We ultimately, uh, in the early days, found seven that we really thought should have been excluded from the outset. So 2,993 organizations uh, that we start with here. This is a well-resourced study. Um, I suppose I will never have the resources again for a research study to, to approach this, the scale of, of this work. It's sad to say, but that's, I think, the reality of things. We have the resources to actually first call each organization to make sure it was alive, it was a going concern. We could sensitize them to what we were doing. We could get a mail, we could verify a mailing address with them. We could get a name of somebody that was knowledgeable about the, uh, the volunteer operations, or at least the broader operations of that organization. So we got a mailing address, uh, we, get, uh, we get a name and we're able to complete this with 80% of charities. So that's a full 20% that are impossible to contact. They're just not the kinds of operating charities that we, we think they are, but that's a, just sort of the nature of the 501c3s that are, that are registered with the, with the Internal Revenue Service. We think we ended up with the, the group that were operating going concerns that we wanted to talk to. From the pre-calls, we actually mail out what were called advanced letters carefully worded to uh, both describe what we were doing, to say who these reputable partners are, federal government, UPS Foundation, Urban Institute, and we're really interested in, in volunteer administration. And uh, you know, these organizations aren't used to hearing that. And uh, you know, that, so we're trying to reinforce the legitimacy of this particular project. We invite, we encourage participation, but we haven't actually asked for it yet. We're stepping up to them. <coughs> <coughs> trying to signal and reinforce the legitimacy of the study, and we think that we, they, we've then prepared the ground with these advanced letters for actual calls. So this original study was done with uh, phone interviews to uh, the people that we'd in, identified in the pre-calls. Uh, we uh, conducted that 20-minute, uh, average of 20-minute interview with organizational representative familiar with uh, volunteer management. We were careful to define for this group what we mean by volunteer. It's not obvious to everyone. It's not obvious. It shouldn't be obvious to anyone exactly what's meant for volunteer because it can mean different things in, in different contexts. And since we were particularly interested in volunteering and uh, organizations working with volunteers, uh, we, we felt we need to be really clear about what we, what we meant by it. The last two points here are particularly important. The first one being that we, we wanted to tell people that we weren't talking about their boards of directors. Now, of course, boards of directors are important volunteers in our nonprofit organizations. They are just a different kind of volunteer. The way that the organization uh, relies on its board of directors, the way that uh, it uh, works with its board of directors is importantly different from how that organization works with, with other volunteers. And there are many scholars in the field that study governance and boards of directors. We know a fair amount about that. We're interested in something else. We're interested in your non-board volunteers. Secondly, we wanted to sort of warn people away from thinking about all the walkers that they have in fundraising events. If that's all they're doing, then we're not considering them, vo them volunteers. If they're actually sitting at the table and registering the workers as they come in, well, that's the volunteer. But we wanted to warn people away from special events participants who were doing more than, say, walking in a particular event. So with this kind of sensitization, we, we sort of dug into, the, uh, we dug into the study a little bit. Talk you know, more as I talk about some of the results here in a little bit about what the core survey content is, but it was really geared after a long process of give and take with these various federal partners and a national advisory board to come up with a, a survey instrument that captured the range of things that we were interested in, particularly their adoption of various volunteer management practices, which ended up being really core to, uh, to the study, and their strategy for involving more volunteers.
we ended up with uh, doing really good in terms of response. 69.3% uh, of organizations uh, 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 responded to the survey, uh, taking into account organizations we ultimately were not able to contact because of non-working phone numbers. Um, so we end up with, big number at the top, 1,753 uh, data points, so organizations that actually responded to us. Not all of those ended up being useful to us because we were screening out those organizations that said they didn't work with anybody that met our definition of a volunteer. Oh yeah, we have a board of directors of course, but we don't have anybody else that really counts as a volunteer. So we ended up with 1,354 respondents who reported working with volunteers. Just a last technical note here is the number of cases that we uh, were able to convert to response with financial incentives. We offered uh, at the end of our survey uh, period uh, $50 to nonprofit organizations uh, that seemed to be reluct otherwise reluctant to respond to the survey. And we ended up with an additional 146 cases, which is 11% of our respondents uh, because of this extra money and extra step we're able to do to be able to uh, increase our response rate. Uh, those ended up being a little bit different. The incentive completers have fewer volunteer management strategies. Uh, we could say that we introduce bias by focusing on bringing those organizations in, or we might say that we reduced bias. These organizations were less likely to respond because they didn't have a developed volunteer program, uh, but we want to include those organizations. So by offering these, these incentives, we may well have increased the represent representatives of this uh, particular respondent pool. The thing that the federal government and the field as a whole was interested in was primarily descriptive. That's often true when we're talking to practice as academics. What are sort of the high level findings that we have here? Yes, some relationships might be interesting, but you know, what are some of the big picture things that come out of this? <coughs> and so the initial reports that we had, uh, reports, uh, meetings with lots of people in the, in the room to report what we were finding, uh, press releases uh, to report some of the sort some of the big descriptive kinds of kinds of findings. <clears throat> Here are some of the things that were sort of banner kinds of headlines from the descriptive part of this survey. Um, there are a bunch of organizations that don't rely on volunteers. <coughs> 20% of organizations that don't have volunteers of any type, but a number of them do. So, uh, you know, 80% of organizations, at least, you know, the way we defined our population, rely on volunteers. Most of these are in direct service kinds of roles, social service organizations, healthcare organizations, where there's direct contact with clients, but volunteers are broader than that. And that has implications for how we manage our volunteers if they are working indirectly, <clears throat> with clients, or if they're involved with fundraising, or if they're involved in advocacy in a way that doesn't bring them into contact with clients. <clears throat> and so this diversity of the way that people engage organizations was important in thinking about volunteer management practices. The last two were important points in thinking about the amount of um, sort of commitment that these nonprofit organizations have to volunteers. When you say three out of five have a paid staff person responsible for management of volunteers, uh, you know, your first reaction might be, well, that's pretty good, three out of five. <clears throat> when three out of five dentists recommend something, that's pretty good. Uh, but that leaves 40% um, of organizations that work with volunteers that have no, no, uh, no, no staff engagement in the management of those volunteers. 60% do, but in our classes, 60% is a D minus. So maybe it's a little overly harsh to say you have failed organization if you don't have a staff member committed to giving your volunteers a good experience because there are many organizations that might have a committed volunteer that organizes the other volunteers. There are ways of doing that. But on the whole, this paints a picture of an under-resourced part of our nonprofit sector, a large number of organizations that are not committing the resources to providing good experiences for our volunteers.
The last point here reinforces this, and that has to do with our questions about how much time does that staff person, if you have one, if you've got a staff person that is committed to working with, uh, with uh, your volunteer administration, how much of that person's job is volunteer administration? The average respondent said it was only 30% of that person's job. That's low. But the important point in my mind is it's less than 50%. If anything is less than 50% of your job, then that's not what you do. That's not what you think of yourself as professionally. So for those people who say, yeah, I just spend 30% of my time in volunteer administration and 70% in various programmatic activities, you're a program manager. So you aren't, get it, you aren't going to the volunteer uh, management conferences locally, regionally, or nationally. You aren't trying to get certified as a volunteer administrator because you have not incorporated in your mind that you are a volunteer administrator. It's just something you're required to do on the side because somebody needs to do it. So additional evidence of sort of an under-resourced commitment to volunteer administration. This question about how much commitment does the volunteer administrator uh, have uh, towards volunteer administration percentage of their time ended up being a core component of our concept, conception of volunteer management capacity. If that organization isn't committing staff resources, then its, uh, its capacity is lower in its ability to engage and provide good opportunities for its volunteers. The other component of volunteer management capacity are these items that we, uh, we created from a list of best practices that had been promulgated in the nonprofit sector. We ended up asking nine different questions to our respondents about their uh, adoption of various best practices regarding volunteer administration. The good news up here is that these bars reach most of the way across the page in all of these cases. So I take that to mean that at least all of our respondents, uh, at least most of our respondents are aware of these practices and have engaged them at least to some degree. The bad news is in the darker part of the bar. Can you see two different colors in those bars? The lighter color is those that have adopted that practice to some degree, whereas the, one, the darker part of the bar are the ones that have adopted it to a large degree. They've really gone, gone whole in and, and adopting that particular management practice. And in this case, looking only at the darker part of this bars, there's only one management practice here that a majority of nonprofit organizations had, had adopted. And that is in supervision and communication with volunteers. Yay, more than half of our nonprofit organizations that work with volunteers have adopted to a great degree supervision and, and uh, communication with volunteers. All the other management practices fall at less than half and some well under half. The last one here, providing training for paid staff and actually working with volunteers in a productive way is less than one in five nonprofit organizations adopting that to a large degree. So this becomes a uh, important part of our conception of management capacity. First, what are you putting in terms uh, of staff time into providing productive experience for volunteers? Secondly, what are you doing in terms of administrative capacity and policy in place to make sure that you're providing productive experiences for your volunteers? Part of the descriptive component of these management capacities was trying to get a sense of how these things vary across different types of organizations. And I'll just quickly make a couple of points about how these things vary. Uh, these various symbols up here correspond, in this case, to different sizes of nonprofit organizations. The, the diamond is less than $100,000 in annual expenditures, ranging up to the triangles, which is more than $5 million in annual expenditures. And the thing that jumps off the chart here is just a handful of triangles. The largest organizations over here are more likely to have screening procedures to identify suitable volunteers, to have written policies and job descriptions for volunteer involvement, and uh, to have recognition activities such as award ceremonies for, for uh, volunteers. So we get to start to get some basic understanding of how these management practices vary across different kinds of organizations. There's also a question, wrong one, what I do, flip it up. There's also the question of uh, 
how these management practices vary according to how volunteers are used in the organization. The important point to note here are the diamonds, which are those organizations that are primarily using their volunteers in direct service kinds of, kinds of ways, because the diamonds tend to fall quite a ways to the right over here. That's encouraging to see. The organizations that are involved more in uh, direct service, volunteers in direct service are doing more to provide uh, training and productive experience for those volunteers. A third quick point here would be uh, how these vary by subsector. The thing that jumps off this chart here are the asterisks, which are health organizations, which are more likely on many of these. Uh, liability coverage, collection of information on volunteer numbers and hours, screening procedures, written policies and job descriptions, and particularly recognition activities. Partly this is just a size effect, which isn't controlled here. Most of these health organizations are pretty large. But part of this also is just the greater professionalization in many of our health organizations, especially hospitals, which are pretty serious about their volunteer administration on, on the whole. Uh, for this room, I should probably at least note the diamonds here, which are the human service organizations, which are actually fare pretty well up against the asterisks and, and most of the, the ones I just called out. Liability coverage, collection of information, screening, written policies and job descriptions, those social service organizations uh, aren't doing as much in terms of management capacity uh, and adoption of these uh, uh, management practices as health organizations, but certainly better than education and arts, culture, and, and humanities organizations. So that first phase of the project was a communication out to the world about what we were seeing and a number of prescriptions about readiness of nonprofit organizations to work with volunteers and, and what we can do to provide a better, but you know, that, that, that time went by. Reports are out, federal government's doing what it's going to do, and uh, my long-term colleague, Jeff Brudney, and I started thinking about who else can we communicate with our academic colleagues who no doubt will be interested in sort of, you know, the sort of the, the, the more conceptual understanding of volunteer administration and how it fits into the management of, of nonprofit organizations. So in the ensuing years, we gave more attention to uh, conceptual development and uh, prediction rather than simple description of what we saw going on here. I've got time. Let me show you two, quickly two, uh, of the uh, sort of uh, main analyses that we did to get a handle on the relationship between volunteer management of recruitment on the one hand and retention on the other hand. So our first foray was into this question of, of uh, predicting how management practices and other organizational characteristics are, are related to recruitment. Now, we're noted here, we're looking at the negative side of this. We're asking about to what extent do you have various problems recruiting volunteers? And is that a big problem or a medium problem or not a problem at all? And we have a, a lot of organizations that are saying, we have various major problems with, uh, these are big problems in recruiting enough volunteers, volunteers with the right skills or expertise or the ones that are available when we need them during the workday. So we have an array of different issues. And so we use these three different questions to add them together to create a sort of an overall assessment of how difficult it is for that organization to recruit volunteers. That's a dependent variable in our analysis. We, we wonder how various organizational characteristics, principally volunteer management capacity, helps us to understand the problems that organizations have in recruiting volunteers. An innovation here that we have here conceptually is breaking some organizational aspects, say organizational characteristics into nature and others into nurture. Meaning that there are some aspects of our organizations that are just innate. If you were a person, we might talk about skin color. Skin color matters for all kinds of social situations in this country, and there's not anything you can do about your skin color. 
So there are organizational kinds of things as well that are sort of innate to it. And no amount of management strategizing is going to influence that organizational characteristic. And then there is nurture, which is the result of organizational culture, strategic decisions. That's within the control of management. And our argument is if we can find things that are related to to, to volunteer management capacity that can be changed to give volunteers a better experience, then that's where we need to put our attention. If it's about nurture and it's hard to change, well, that's another story entirely. So we have this sort of nature-nurture, 1800s biological lens that we, we put up against uh, uh, various organizational characteristics. <laughs> the nature components are these kinds of things. The size, the age of the, the organization's volunteers it has access to, the relationship of the number of staff to the number of volunteers, how intensively it uses its volunteers, how many, how many hours they provide, the number of types of duties available to volunteers. I call these nature components. The organization has less, um, less um, control over. I have... Uh, talked about this with a dozen different audiences over the years. And so I've gathered up lots and lots of great impressions about why this is not a great list of, of nature things. I've heard great arguments about how their organization has a fair amount of influence over some of these kinds of uh, items. But, you know, sorry, the paper's published and we can't change it now. Uh, these uh, uh, items I conceived of as being, as being nature. These nurture items, at least, we have more control over. Maybe we'll at least allow that. The degree of adoption of various volunteer management practices. So we have a sort of a strategic management option. Uh, the cultural orientation towards support of volunteers. This is more broad than the volunteer program. This is the top management team. This is the board of directors. If they don't value the volunteers, if they aren't willing to put resources towards the vo volunteers, the volunteers can smell that. And we think that's an important nurture component that will influence volunteer management capacity. Uh, well, will include influence ability to recruit volunteers. And then lastly is the array of recruitment strategies that the organization will, uh, will, uh, will, will adopt. Uh, there's one big uh, regression model here. I'll put it on two different charts. There are the nature portions here. Um, uh, how do these sort of the nature, how does the nature of the organization relate to various recruitment problems? Um, just one thing I want to point to up here, and I got a star by it, and that is the prevailing age of the volunteers uh, in that particular organization. So we have a negative relationship here. What does this mean? As organizations are, organizations that rely on young volunteers, as that goes up, as reliance on young volunteers goes up, recruitment problems goes down. Easy to recruit young volunteers. Dime a dozen. They're able to get the young volunteers uh, in the door uh, pretty, pretty easily. Harder to recruit, uh, especially people in the middle, uh, but, uh, but even older volunteers. At least, you know, younger volunteers are easy to, to get in the door. So that's one thing I want to point to because I'm going to show you a contrary finding here in a little bit. The nurture portion of the model here, I want to point to a couple different things. I should point out that a lot of the management practices uh, don't matter here, aren't related to recruitment problems, which in retrospect maybe shouldn't have been that surprising to me. The uh, volunteers outside of the organization haven't got to that part of the psychological contracting where they're, they're aware of what's going on inside the organization. Management practices are later. They're just becoming aware of what the organization does and how it's going to treat them. So the management practices, by and large, don't matter too much. What matters is what they smell regarding the culture of the organization. When organizations say they lack funds for supporting volunteers, that there's indifference from staff toward volunteers, that they lack time for staff to train and supervise volunteers, recruitment problems go through the roof. How that happens mechanistically, we can't say for sure with a survey, but we see a clear relationship between a poor culture toward volunteers and problems in trying to recruit those volunteers. So. Organizations can choose whether or not to value volunteers or not. 
That's a, then we can nurture the culture of our organization to be more respectful of volunteers. And failure to value and invest in volunteers results in problems and in attracting them. So some of those are some of the some of the things that came out of this 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 particular study where we focused on the recruitment of volunteers. There's a second component here, a second rabbit hole that we went down where we focused on retention of volunteers. We asked this question. Of the volunteers who worked with your organization one year ago, approximately what percentage would you say are still involved as volunteers? And uh, lo and behold, we get the full range. We get 3% of organizations that say nobody. We don't have anybody a year later that we were working with. And then you get 17% of organizations that say all of them. We have all of the same volunteers now a year later and everything in between with a median of 80% retention over one year. Our question then is, to what extent do organizational characteristics and pr principally volunteer management capacity related to your ability to retain volunteers over time? We get the array of similar kinds of independent variables or influencers on, on uh, ability to retain your volunteers. Certainly volunteer management practices and investment in volunteer resources, which we, which we call volunteer management capacity. Uh, the value the volunteers bring to their charities and various other organizational characteristics. Their size, the prevailing age of volunteers, et cetera. Something neat we did in one of the early reports where we presented this was uh, a, uh, our effort to try to communicate this to a broad audience with a, uh, with a, with a graphic. And I'm not seeing this done too much, so I sort of like it. Am I looking at the right thing? Yes. Um, this, is a, this is a regression model. Um, and uh, this is, uh, these are standardized betas so that we can, the relative, the length of the bar is important relative to the lengths of the other bars. And so we could sort of explain that to a broad audience. We could say, all right, you know, it's hard to exactly explain to you exactly what's going on in a multiple regression model, but the lengths of the bars matter here. And if there's no bar, it means it didn't matter. And, and so we think that we think that that, uh, at least I think it was helpful. Here's something to look at. Some of these volunteer management practices suddenly matter. Whereas they mattered less in terms of recruitment of volunteers, some of these things matter more when it comes to retention of volunteers. Which ones matter? Well, the top four are qualitatively different than the four below them. The four, I would say, uh, are focused on the experience of the volunteer. Recognition activities, training and professional development for the volunteers, screening and matching to assignments, supervision and communication with volunteers. And so those things seem to matter, at least statistically, in explaining whether or not those, organi those, those volunteers are going to be coming back or not. The four under that are less relevant to the volunteers. They may be uh, relevant to the organization or other organizational stakeholders, like a funder, that might care about like measurement of the number of volunteer hours, uh, but they're not particularly relevant to the volunteers themselves. Lo and behold, they don't matter to retention of volunteers. So that was good to see. There's one in particular that is a finding that's particularly associated with this study. You know, a lot of people, if they say anything about this, they're like, Hager and Brudney said something really strange here that we don't know what to make of. And that is this negative relationship between retention and the amount of supervision and communication that organizations do with their volunteers. That negative relationship means organizations, as they say, they supervise and communicate with volunteers, have lower retention of those volunteers over time. That's not what we expect. This is the most commonly adopted volunteer management practice. It's certainly promulgated as a positive management practice. We'd like to think we should supervise and communicate with our volunteers, but volunteers tend to learn more, leave more, when they're working in organizations that have adopted this to a, a great degree. Why is that? Well, again, it's, it's just a survey, right? You can't learn much about the mechanisms because of the survey. But we suspect it has something to do with the, uh, 
with the nature of the assignments that these, or that these volunteers are, assign, are assigned to. They get plenty of supervision and communicatedness at in their regular jobs. When they go to work in a, as a volunteer, they want to have a little bit of independence. They want to be able to do what they're going, what, what they want to do to, uh, to, to, to communicate their values in that volunteer assignment. And if that volunteer assignment starts seeming a lot like their regular job, they seem to be more likely to, to leave it. I've heard other explanations, possible explanations of this effect. Uh, it's, a, it's an odd one that shows up across our analyses of this particular point. The last thing to point to here is this long bar down here at the bottom. Remember on that, that's uh, what, four or five slides back when I was talking about recruitment? We found that young people are very easy to recruit. This negative fact says that young people don't stick around. So we have a negative influence. Organizations that have young volunteers are less likely, that's the negative relationship, to retain their volunteers. So they're easy to find, they're easy to get, bring in, but because of their life course, which we can't do a whole lot about, they're quickly moving on to the next thing. They're trying lots of different things. Even if they want to be committed to this for a while, they move, their life changes, they have a child. There's, there's enough volatility for these young people that they are less likely to stay in their, in their volunteer assignments. So a contrary finding here, a very different kind of finding uh, related to retention uh, that we found in, in recruitment. The takeaway here for this particular piece is that Retention is strengthened by management practices that focus on the needs of volunteers, which has become a consistent sort of finding in this particular study, a clarion call that if you're going to give a good experience to your volunteers and retain them, then you need to have management practices in place that show that you, vol that you value their time. And secondly, uh, even the best management can't compete with the life demands of some volunteers. It's easy to bring those young people in and maybe you want to keep them around, but they're going to leave regardless of the quality of the management experiences that you have in your particular organization. It's a new day. We've been wanting to return to this study for a long time. I, I, I called up uh, the, uh, the UPS Foundation when we hit the 10-year mark, or we're coming up on the 10-year mark. I'm like, ooh, I can sell a 10 years later idea to the, uh, to the UPS Foundation. Thing was, you know, the people that had valued studying volunteer management back in 2002 and 2003 weren't around anymore. You know, the woman I talked to had never heard of me or the study, and it ended up being a pretty short conversation. Um, it was Jeff Brudney this past summer who uh, was just, I don't know, maybe he just gets more newsletters than I do. He saw, you know, the, uh, the, nat, the, nat, the Corporation for National Community Service saying, we're going to do a round of grantees. Um, they did one a couple of years ago, too. I just hadn't been attuned to this. And I read it, and I, every, every line that I read and what they were looking to fund among their grantees screamed revisiting the VMC project, volunteer management capacity. And Jeff's like, is this our chance to do this? And I'm like, geez, yeah, we better. So we, uh, we put together a proposal to, to return to this. Uh, it's funded. We are one of, I don't know, a half dozen grant, different grantees, meaning they're, they're spreading their money out. Uh, so it's, this, this, this study currently is much less well-funded than the original study, but you know we're going to try to do what we can on a shoestring. It has a two-year trajectory, started in October of 2017, uh, and runs all the way through the two-year mark in September of, of 2019. And uh, Jeff Brudney, my long-term collaborator, is involved in, in all aspects of this particular, uh, particular study. The sample will be a little bit complicated and that there are two parts to it. We're returning to the original sample. Uh, at least, you know, we plan to return to the original sample. So we, uh, we took those 1,354 respondents with volunteers that I've been talking about for the last 20 minutes or so, uh, and we, we, we looked to see if they are still filing with the IRS. They're still listed in the IRS business master file. 
So, you know, this past Christmas, I pull down the most current business master file and I, and I line them up. We find 240 of our respondents that are no longer represented in the business master file. So I have a doctoral student working on the project. She's digging. She is looking for internet presence for these organizations. Uh, she's finding some of them. Some of them merged. You know, some of them went invisible. Uh, we're going to call the ones we're unsure about, the ones that look like they should still be in the sample. We're going to include them. Uh, but we need to come to grips with those 240 that fell out. So we can try to collect data from as many of the original 1354 as possible. Why? Longitudinal data is great. We will, for the first time, be able to talk about volunteer management, administration, <coughs> and the relationships between these various variables as change over time. No one's ever been able to do that before. And so if we can execute on this, this study, we'll have, have, uh, have, have, some, have some pretty great data. What we don't get with just returning to the original sample is a picture of what volunteer management capacity looks like as a whole right now. And so we're going to supplement that original sample with 2,000 new cases. Do we just pick 2,000 random new cases? No. The characteristic of our original sample is that they are all old. Right? If you look at just the population of nonprofit organizations out there, most of them are pretty young and aren't going to live very long. <clears throat> but they're pretty young. It's very unusual. I mean, those, our original organizations, are all at least 18 years old now because we sampled them in 2000. So that's a very odd sample. So what we're supplementing it with here is 2,000 cases that are younger. They had, the, had their exemption ruling since 2000. So they're all less than 18 years old. So what we'll do at the end is take uh, what we can get from our original sample, what we can get from our new sample, and we'll do some statistical gymnastics with weighting procedures to try to create a, a portrait of what the entire current uh, sample, uh, uh, I'm sorry, population of, of uh, nonprofits looked like in terms of its volunteer management capacity. That's the vision for the new study. Uh, are there pre-calls? Are there advanced letters? No, this study is, is funded at a much lower uh, amount than that uh, a great study we were able to do 16 years ago. Uh, we're planning an online survey. The uh, uh, online surveys are great because of the advent of technology over the last decade or, or so. What we don't have is a way to get this survey in front of these organizations. We have a list of these organizations, but nowhere is a list of who can speak authoritatively about uh, the, uh, the, 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 the management of volunteers in your organization and what's that person's email address. And so we're going to spend a long time. We have about eight months. We have most of this you know, year and all through the summer budgeted for digging. So we have student workers, uh, one currently in Phoenix, two currently in North Carolina, and both of those numbers will grow as we get a better handle on the tasks uh, that, are, that are sleuthing the internet. Uh, in the best cases, you, uh, you, you put an EIN number into Google and up pops the organization you're interested in. And it takes you to an informative web page. Uh, and then one of those web pages says, the volunteer coordinator is Susan Johnson, and here's your email address. Well, that's great. And that will be the case for many of these. So, uh, not so easy in many of the other cases, uh, where, which will require either more digging uh, and, in many cases, phone calls. How well this goes, I don't know. I don't know how well this will go. And that's partly why we have such a long time horizon uh, and a lot of the project going towards staff support in this digging that's going on. But unless we have a right person and that person's email address, we don't have an email that can go out to that uh, person to lead them to this, this survey. The survey will be done over Qualtrics. Is that here? Yeah. yeah. Via email pointing to Qualtrics. Uh, we'll have much of the original content, uh, which you have to do for longitudinal purposes, right? If you're doing comparing time A to time B, you have to measure the same thing in, in both places. There's a lot of content that, uh, that Professor Brudney and I, sorry, we don't need that. That was extraneous to our interest now and we're cutting it out. But there are other things that are 
new and interesting now or didn't get enough of our attention back uh, in the original study. And the two that we keep coming around to are the last two bullets on this particular slide. One is uh, how technology has inv influenced volunteer, uh, volunteer management over the last at least 15 years or so. Part of that has to do with how we recruit our volunteers, how we market and get the word out to prospective volunteers, uh, especially through social media. Part of this is about the use of uh, volunteer, uh, I'm sorry, technology inside our organizations. Software that allows uh, uh, volunteers to check in um, to, um, for the organization to know who's, who's in the place at that particular time and what they're doing, who they're assigned to. And this, uh, this aggregates hours. We know about the hours. And we know how long Susie has been doing this so she can get her 100-hour pen. Uh, so technology has advanced quite a bit, and we want to get a better handle on that. The other thing that it's both changed and we feel like we didn't get as good a handle as we should have in the first round is, has to do with the nature of volunteer assignments. There's sort of this presumption in the field and in a lot of the literature that our volunteers are long-term super volunteers. They are, uh, they are, they're gonna be there for the long haul and they're committing 10 hours a week uh, to this particular volunteer assignment. And some of those are st still out there, especially retirees that are, are working in many of our nonprofit organizations. But there has always been, and now there seems to be more of what we call episodic volunteers and younger people that are more drawn to episodic assignments. And by episodic, we mean temporary assignments. We don't plan on being in them very long. They're short term. They're not going to last very long, or they're occasional, seasonal kinds of assignments. They're not going to be the long term. And uh, you, you would have a certain orientation to managing long term volunteers that would be very different if you're primarily catering to either a population interested in short-term episodic assignments or if that's the nature of the volunteer gigs that you have available for your volunteers. So we want to get a better handle on, on this. It's early. Um, the samples are drawn. Uh, we are now digging for emails and those internet searches, both for the 240 that weren't in the business master file and, and, uh, and for those that, that were. Uh, we hope by later this semester, probably by April, to do, to do survey programming. We still need to come to grips with some of the changes in the survey instrument. The particular sticking point for us right now is what other kinds of volunteer management practices should we ask about? Rather than, you know, there's certainly the nine that we asked about originally, but, uh, but, but Professor Brudney in particular says there are probably two or three other things that are either important to practice right now or have been discussed in the literature that we need to give attention to. So once we come to grips with that and a few other items in the survey, we can turn to uh, programming of the Qualtrics survey. Probably by May, by May we won't have all of the digging done for especially the more difficult uh, cases that don't have contact information, but we'll have the low-hanging fruit. We don't need to go out to everybody at once. We can and should do this in waves. So the first wave of survey should be able to go out uh, in, in May uh, when it starts to get really hot in Phoenix. Um, we'll have a full, geez, how far away is that? That's a year. Uh, before data collection closes, and then we have a, you know, that whole semester uh, to think about a report writing uh, and communication in a variety of ways uh, to, the, to the broader public. So that's, that's where we're headed. Uh, and this, uh, I'd like to be able to come and talk to you both about where we've been and where we're headed because uh, maybe you have thoughts about content. Maybe you have thoughts here about method that can have a direct influence on, on where we're headed. Uh, before I open up for questions, though, I want to mention that this, uh, now that we're finally dug into VMC2, it gives us an idea about other wrinkles that can add to a broader program of, of studying volunteer administration and volunteer management capacity. What we haven't had are case studies. Um, that give us a sort of a deeper understanding of the mechanisms of what's happening inside of these organizations. So we want to get down that road with or without additional funding. This will also give us the volunteer perspective 
about uh, how they re relate to various aspects of volunteer management capacity to let us sort of flesh out a better understanding. Pest management company. Um, volunteers. Uh, we need to understand this psychological contract better and the relationship to various aspects of volunteer management capacity. And unless we have these case studies, I think it'll be hard to get a handle on that. We've talked about surveys of volunteers and organizations. Hard, hard to do methodologically. Case studies may be the best way to get down this road. Um, we want to do a focus on a particular subsector. And a, sub, a piece of a subsector. And what we think we're going to focus on are human service organizations that, that can be thought of as disability, focused on a disability topic. Um, I think that allow, let, let's focus, really focus in on the mechanisms of volunteer management capacity and their relationship with volunteers. Part of the reason we're getting down that road is that we have a colleague, a faculty member at uh, Shenzhen University in Shenzhen, China, who studies disability nonprofit organizations. And so uh, I went to one of, uh, I went to his meeting, a uh, conference he had in Shenzhen this past summer, and I talked about this project. And I said, this might be funded. It hadn't been funded yet, the, the larger project. If it was, maybe there's some collaboration in the offing. And so he's already thinking concretely about a national China study of volunteer management capacity and disability organizations. If we can get down this road in the United States, we'll have a cross-national cultural comparative study of, uh, of, of disability nonprofits and their volunteer management capacity. Last point, and then I'll be quiet, uh, is uh, we need to understand volunteer administrators a little bit better. It was a telling finding that uh, so few of our staff members that work with volunteers think of themselves as volunteer administrators. They spend so little of their time in actual administration of volunteers. We need to understand them better, but we also need to understand better the people who are really committed to volunteer administration. The people that call themselves volunteer administrators or volunteer managers, the ones that are members of the local associations and attend the national meetings and get the national certification. We want to understand them better so that we can have a greater understanding of this whole realm of organizational volunteer management capacity and their efforts to sort of engage individuals who are constantly negotiating this psychological contract about whether they want to engage in a particular cause or not. I think if I press this, it's the end. Thank you. There's an email address for me. Yes, thank you. We have 15 minutes. We have time for questions, so let me know if you'd like to have the mic. Please introduce yourself. Uh I'm David Crampton. I'm on the faculty here. Um, since you've done some research on the demise of nonprofits, yeah. I'm wondering if you have some ideas about whether VMC is important in terms of whether nonprofits survive. Holy cow, you mean cross fertilizing my various research interests? Mm -hmm. This may be the first time that idea has ever came up. And I don't have an immediate answer. Okay. All right. You know, I suspect VMC from this, this thread here is ultimately related to the, to the overall success of the organization. The ones that give productive experiences to their volunteers are it's related to the health and the productivity of that organization. And I suspect, and maybe this is the origin of your question, that may have something to do with the eventual life chances of the organization. So uh, I don't know. Now you'll get me thinking about it. Yeah, thank you. That's a great presentation, Mark. Thanks, Dennis. Dennis Young. Um, well, uh, I'm an emeritus professor from Georgia State University, but with a long history here at Case Western Reserve. <laughs> um, is there one of the, I don't know if you didn't call it best practices, but one of the, the principles of volunteer management that you identified uh, good practices uh, was to have in place a volunteer manager, right? Is, is there research behind that, that notion? I mean, or, you know, are there, are there alternative ways of, uh, of kind of looking at this? 
where, um, you know, if I put myself in the position of a program director, I have to make choices about where to use paid staff, where to use volunteers, where to use other kinds, where to use technology, other kinds of, of inputs. And certainly I need to be um, knowledgeable about the, the nature of volunteers and, and uh, how they're best used and how they're best managed and so forth. Um, but is my, am I going to be necessarily more effective or is my organization necessarily going to be more effective if there's someone in a, a higher administration that's in charge of volunteer management? I mean, uh, are we satisfied that that is a principle that, um, by which we, we would judge an organization's uh, effectiveness in volunteer usage? You know, the only people I know who have gotten at this question at all are Hager and Brudney. So I can't say that there's a whole lot of research around this question. It's a, and I tried to skirt it a little bit, it's a bit of a troubling assumption or statement to say you are only effective or you're best thought of as, as effective in your volunteer program if you have a staff person that has a commitment in this particular area. Because you can think of examples where an organization might be otherwise effective by, by not having such a person. That said, we've been pretty comfortable in saying that that organization will at least be more effective or it will be an indication of its commitment to its volunteer program if it will put staff resources behind that particular function. And statistically, anyway, it bears out that those organizations that have those kinds of commitments uh, seem to do better in terms of these kinds of outcomes. So um, at least this literature, right, that stems from this particular study at least supports this troubling assumption that you should have a staff person. Yeah. Hi, Linda Springer, uh, adjunct instructor. Um, thank you for your work on this. It's, yeah, uh, I think, very important. Um, I'm thinking of some of your information about the um, amount of staff time devoted to managing yeah. volunteers. And I'm also curious if there's been research on the need for volunteers in different types of organizations with different missions. And I think some missions require volunteers more than others. And is there any look at the amount of staff time in organizations based on the amount of volunteers that they actually need and use? Yeah, I actually removed a slide an hour ago when I was prepping over here um, because I, you know, I thought I had too much here. So there are these volunteer management practices and I'm talking about our, our description of these practices and seeing how they vary across organizational characteristics. And I kept three up there. Uh, the size of the organization, the subsector of the organization, and I forget the third. What I cut was uh, its relationship to its intensiveness and its, and its work with its volunteers, which I think sort of gets at how you're, you're describing this. And intensiveness in our particular study is sort of a measure of the number of volunteers that that organization engages in a particular time and the number of hours that it, it engages. And those are two different things. You can have lots of volunteers, but not many hours. Uh, you can have not many volunteers, but they contribute lots of hours. Uh, and then the best of both is having lots of volunteers contributing lots of hours. And so there's different ways you can get at and add up to an intensiveness in your use of volunteers. Uh, turns out, uh, maybe we'd expect this, but it's good that it bears out in the data that organizations that are, are more intensively use their volunteers uh, seem to be more serious about the adoption of these practices and, and giving them good experiences. So I say maybe it's a little intuitive, but uh, you know, it, it, it bears out that intensiveness, I'm sorry, um, management capacity follows the intensive use of volunteers. Or maybe it's the other way around. You intensively want to use volunteers, so you, you do more to put volunteer management practices into place. Does that come close to your question? Um, a little bit, but I think what I'm getting at more is the nature of the mission of the organization and whether they need volunteers. 
um, and want volunteers. Um, some require more professional trained people to work with clients. And I'm just wondering if, if you've looked at that at all and if that's played any role in it. Yeah, not specifically. What are you imagining? What would you expect to see? Well, I'm just aware of a few organizations that have just decided they're not going to use volunteers because they want people who are trained in a certain way um, to work with their clients. And so they wouldn't use the, the practices that you've um, well, described. Yeah. Right. If we asked an organization, do you use volunteers, and they say no, we actually stop the interview there. If we kept going and asking about management practices of volunteers, I guess we'd expect them not to have any, right, because they don't, don't work with volunteers. Um, so, yeah, yeah, there are, yeah, yeah. But the question you could change is, if you currently use X amount of volunteers, would your organization benefit from using more, right? Because they might be happy with their five volunteers, and so to add that data to the study, do you see a need for your organization to, would it be beneficial to recruit more volunteers or have more volunteers involved? And just how would that relate? Something like, do you, do you have as many volunteers as you need or do you wish you had more? You get to wordsmith it over the next year, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> would, it, would it help increase the capacity of your organization if you had more volunteers engaged? Okay. Because it may not. Yeah. Linda, that's a really good question. This is Scott Wilkes, I'm on faculty here. Because I was thinking how the management of volunteers could also be a, the type of organization affects the management of volunteers, which could be driven by liability depending upon the nature of the organization and what they're doing. And maybe there are some, certain organizations that high, have a higher liability threshold of what the volunteers do. Right. So that, that factors in. But I had another thought about the episodic nature of volunteerism and how that relates to management. And what's the long-term implication? Because it seems as though if there is a cycle a number of volunteers coming in that you have to constantly train and recruit, that that puts a strain ultimately on organizations and the management, and whether or not that might undermine volunteerism altogether. The uh, liability coverage and insurance protection seems to be mostly the domain of health and human services where you know people work in education arts culture and humanities organizations you have you have less of a need we shouldn't be surprised then that they're adopting that to a lesser extent because it's not as much of a need for their particular healthcare. organization healthcare healthcare organizations have have the greater need and the, here right it's the second item health do human services do but you see less need of it in some of these other other domains um, so, and this has cropped up periodically too. It seems like we, we ding organizations for not adopting best practices. Um, but you make the point, and we actually we do elsewhere as well, that s many of these organizations don't need to adopt some of these practices because they're not particularly relevant to what they do. So uh, liability coverage and insurance protection is a good example of that. Go long. <laughs> Online question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This question comes from Ashley online. Um, based on the research you've done, do you have any advice on how to reinvent the staff to volunteer culture, um, specifically to help staff learn how to appreciate and engage with volunteers? Well, that's a great question, Ashley. Where, wherever she is. Hi there, Ashley. Um, yeah, this is a broader question uh, than just talking to volunteer administrators, which we, we've tended to do in most of our, most of our study. Uh, but uh, there's the need to engage sort of the higher levels. The culture of the organization falls to um, the top management staff and the, um, the, the board of directors of the organization. And unless they are sensitized to the value of volunteers. I mean, it's not at all unusual for top management staff and board chairs to say, 
uh, volunteers are free, we don't need to commit resources to them, let's just get what we get. And they don't have any sense of the needs of volunteers, the professionalization of the field, the value of volunteer management capacity to recruitment and retention of volunteers. But uh, I, I like to think this kind of conversation that stems from this kind of research, it helps. There's, there's ways of trying to communicate that to those, those influential members, right? Not the volunteer management team, which usually doesn't have a lot of pull or play uh, in the broader organization, but in the... Uh, in the uh, board and in the top management team to the extent that they hear this message and it's reinforced in their understanding of how the organization works, then I think that pays lots of dividends towards resource allocation to volunteer management capacity, which cascades into better experiences for the volunteers. Uh, we emphasize it in our master's degree in nonprofit uh, organizations, uh, not because we think we're training volunteer managers, but because whatever our graduates end up working in, whatever they end up doing, if they better understand the value of volunteer administration, then they can, they can communicate that and they can implement that. They can be, they can be ambassadors for these ideas. My name is Katie. I'm a part-time master's and nonprofit student. And one of the things that we've talked about in um, looking at the master's program is that we don't have a course on volunteer management here. So are there recommendations that you have for, we, we touch on it in some of the different classes, but there's not one course designated for mm -hmm. it. So uh, do you have some suggestions for our program to think about incorporating as we move forward? We didn't for a long time either. We had a general human resource management course. And uh, for a long time, it, de it depended on who taught the course, what the content looked like. There was so much very more variability in that class than I think most of our others. There were times you get a faculty associate from a, from a hardcore HR background, and it was all about HR policy. And there was no reference to volunteers in that particular course. But I remember another guy that taught it almost all as volunteer administration and very little from, from sort of a harder HR <coughs> point of view. We ultimately split it off and created a separate course in volunteer management. And I was able to create that course because I'd been thinking about these ideas uh, for quite a long time. Uh, and now students can satisfy their HR uh, core requirement in our master's degree by doing either one of those courses. They'll often take both, one as core and one as an elective, uh, but they can do the volunteer administration course as, as core. Um, I taught that course a few times in person and then had to hand it off to a faculty associate and we've now developed as an online version of the class. Uh, but, but people to teach that class, help design and teach that class are probably fairly easy to find. There are a lot of great uh, long-term professional volunteer administrators around Cleveland um, that uh, you know, might be great candidates for, for helping to develop and teach this particular kind of class. We have in Phoenix a uh, local regional association of volunteer administrators. There may well be one here in Cleveland. The Association of Volunteer Administrators of Central Arizona you know, has its regular meetings there in, in Phoenix. And you, know, you probably find a lot of candidates there among a Cleveland uh, variety of that. Yes, uh, Hillary Sparks Roberts, who is the ED of Social Venture Partners in Cleveland, she asked, you mentioned missteps that can break the psychological contract with volunteers. Besides making the volunteer project seem too much like a job, what are some other examples of missteps? I, I think any time, sort of one of the difficulties in satisfying the psychological contract is that volunteers volunteer for lots of different reasons. You know, we like to think that all volunteers are there about commitment to moving the needle on a particular mission, and some are, you know, but some are there to, to develop skills for their resume. Some are there to have fun. Some are there to meet people for social situations. Um, some are satisfying a legal requirement or, or a, you know, a welfare requirement or a school requirement. So volunteers are there for lots of different reasons. And satisfying the psychological contract means knowing what their needs are and satisfying it. So 
that makes it really hard to do. But ultimately, it's about every step of the way bringing that person psychologically closer to making a commitment to the organization. And the missteps come in, in, I guess, a variety of different ways. And maybe it's hard to be really specific about it. You know, if an organization uh, just communicates its mission in a way that's not consistent with how I think about the world or that particular mission, I'm going to stop paying attention to it. If it recruits me with particular words or a particular mode that I'm not paying attention to or doesn't resonate with me, if I think that's an old school organization, I'm a new school social media guy, I may not gravitate toward that organization. I start, I get closer to the organization and I see that it doesn't it doesn't seem to value my time like I think it might. Uh, or it assigns me to something that that's not something that I want to do. Every one of those points can be a, a point of breaking for that person and further engagement with the organization. And it happens every day. The volunteers decide, that's not what I thought. See ya, I'm going to go do something else. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking when you were talking, Recently, in one of the board, uh, boards, but also in terms of a service volunteer activity, that more and more volunteers are getting um, uh, employment incentives for volunteering. Yeah. And so, they're in, in essence, if you're in accounting or, or law or some of the other service profession professions, you actually get into their billable hours for them because they're being paid to engage in the volunteer or through their job. So when you talk about motivation, that sort of flashed in my mind. Yeah. That is certainly one that I'm seeing among young people. Younger. And it's probably easier to retain those volunteers. And you maybe even get some great work out of those volunteers, but their level of commitment may be lower than for people that are there because they want to be. Yeah, good. We're, we're, gonna, have to, we're gonna have to stop here, but the, the good news is that Mark is available after this and for the next uh, roughly an hour. He's, he's available to talk to everyone here. Um, I'd like us to thank him one more time. Thank you. Not many Arizonans come to Cleveland in February. <laughs> and I understand you all wear a lot of sunglasses, so I've got the Mandel School official change agent sunglasses that you can put to good use down south. So thank you all so much for coming this afternoon and look forward to you at the next sessions. Wonderful. Thank you all.